but I masturbated on a plane, nice. like flying from uh, Malaysia back to Chicago. And uh, I was like, this is so funny. This is like some Louis C.K. shit. Let me tell this at an open mic. And I did. And it was awful. And no one laughed. And no one laughed about jerking off on planes. That was your first ever open yeah. mic. Okay. Today, we talk about... Boom, we are live, right? Okay. Yeah. Well, not live, live, but hey, whatever. You know, live enough. Hey. So this is uh, episode something, something. I always lose track because I'm right. always behind on the editing. I'm sorry, man. But... I'd like to welcome a very special guest, Bill Batit, which I now found out from last night, uh, also goes by William, uh, <laughs> the third, yes. right? Okay. Uh, and I'll let you talk about yourself in a second, but what I know about you so far, I've met you on the open mic circuit, uh, so you had a show last night, obviously, uh, a TEDx speaker, apparently, uh, I'd like to hear about that a little bit, published in Time and Huffington, okay, BuzzFeed triggered, uh, headliner in Edinburgh Fringe Festival. Jurious Doctor, a.k.a. Lawyer, right? And then Sirius XM as well. And you have a SoundCloud. Is this a rapper thing? Uh, no, no, even though I look like a SoundCloud <laughs> rapper. I wish, man. I'm going to come out with my rap album sooner or later, though. Okay. Yeah. And then, uh, oh, yeah. And uh, before I forget, too, uh, your Instagram, Bill Batit, but you're also on Twitter at Bill Bitweet. Bill Bitweet, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just looking at your layout here. I just noticed how, like, pristine this thing is. It's like, pick, pick, tweet, pick, pick, tweet, pick, pick. Pick, pick, tweet. So that's uh, clever. Thank nice you. Man. All right, so welcome. <laughs> God damn it. It's too late. <laughs> I don't know thing. why the soundboard sucks. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, tell us about yourself, man. Welcome. Oh, uh, thanks. And thanks for like uh, doing a, such a great introduction. It's Edinburgh, though. Is uh, it? It's, yeah. it's Edinburgh. So did you spell it wrong? Did, did I spell it wrong? <laughs> I no. I'm just reading off your uh, your bio. Uh, here, like I think they pronounce it like strange or whatever because you know they're Scottish and okay. they're weird people. But um, yeah, dude, uh, life's good. You know, I'm a lawyer, comedian, barely a lawyer, like only in um, passing the bar and like finishing law school. I've, I've never practiced. Okay. Yeah. And uh, and so was that something you did? Because usually how I like to start these is like, what was your comedy come up? So like, uh, when did you start comedy? How is that related? If it is at all to the lawyer thing versus whatever else was going on before that? Like, what was what was going on there? Yeah. So uh, I started comedy in Chicago. Um, weird enough, I was Matt. And that's mastur- where you're from? I'm not from there. That's where I went to law school. Gotcha, okay. Um, but I masturbated on a plane, nice. like flying from uh, Malaysia back to Chicago. And uh, I was like, this is so funny. This is like some Louis C.K. shit. Let me tell this at an open mic. And I did. And it was awful. And no one laughed. And no one laughed about jerking off on planes. That was your first ever open yeah. mic. Okay. And um, I had done it like once or twice before that. But then I had sworn off comedy to focus on law school. But that time, I don't know what it was. Uh, somebody invited me out again. And then I started performing all the time. And then um, on Yom Kippur, I'm not Jewish, but I, I observed Yom Kippur. Um, I had a job offer to be a lawyer for the Marine Corps and all I had to do was do the physical fitness, then go to boot camp, and basically it was gonna be like a done deal. The guy hadn't got back to me for like three weeks and um uh to set up the appointment and then I did Yom Kippur and I thought about if today was my last day of life, what would I have done differently about my life? I was like, I don't really give a fuck about being a lawyer for the Marine Corps. I kinda just want to move to New York and do comedy. And um so at that point he actually texted me that day and I was like, No, dude, I found another job. Did I uh, canceled all my other interviews and basically focused really hard on comedy. Then um my first slash second year of comedy I did like 365 consecutive days and that's why I did a TED talk on and everything like that 365 days of comedy yeah yeah so I performed every day like usually three to five times a night really yeah. holy shit I, I was terrible though and I actually got worse <laughs> like you know I was like I was like no man you know I'm taking this super seriously but um yeah and then uh, I um, ran a show at the Laugh Factory Friday night show called uh, the Young Hustle show it ends up being the biggest show in town and then yeah and then so it was like a cool experience I really just loved comedy and I loved because like I was a dating coach and so I was used to rejection so bombing didn't really bother me and so interesting yeah, interesting. yeah. yeah I remember us talking about that briefly last night yeah uh, <laughs> but <laughs> I had no idea that was like a real thing you were doing are you still doing that uh so I've coached people I coach people online still um but I kind of tailored it off of that and kind of just moved it solely towards uh like business stuff and business consulting okay. with using some of the the frameworks from game in that respect and not like the game the game where it's like, yeah, you know what you want to do during this meeting? Pull out like magic Pulling cards, right. yeah, you know, <laughs> some uh, magic tricks, but just kind of overall like conversational dynamics and flow. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, uh, how important is peacocking really? Um, I see. Here's the thing: is so like I think that because I only know two pickup artists, quote unquote, if you will. Yeah, one is the guy on TV, and then you, and oh, both of you wearing these fucking. Was, so so th- what <laughs> ended up happening pieces. with my fashion was it kind of just happened 
like naturally like just like i just started like testing out stuff and like doing too much and everything like that i don't think peacocking is necessary at all actually i think it actually gets in the way my friends who have the highest lay count dress generic as fuck highest well, leg count lay a uh, lay count so like the most oh, lay count yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. so they, that sex like 200 300 women but like they're like you know, they're just like a t-shirt and jeans guy. They're not even that great of looking. Right. Um, because what it ends up being is like a girl can paint who they want them to be on top of them. So it's kind of like a blank canvas. Whereas like the whole concept of peacocking was that you stand out and have attention in a room um, that you don't even need to basically garner yourself, right? Interesting. And it started off with really audacious outfits, like, yo, like massive hats, stuff that you'd never wear, completely yeah, yeah. ridiculous. Right. And then, but yeah, to me, I just like dressed in... Fucking a little bit weird. So, okay, all yeah. right. And uh, how much of that has to do with your background? Because your your dad is black, your mom is Indian. Yeah, right. So, any fashion component from that, or this was all just on your own, or what's? Um, mostly on my own. Um, it it was just kind of just like. I think putting on muscle was like the first part and kind of like changing my fashion. And then when I moved, so I did post-grad work in the UK. I was living in London and I was living in Camden town. It's kind of like a grunge scene. Okay. Moved from there to Chicago and I had like kind of like a fashion like crisis where I just, I don't know. Like Chicago is everyone's just like generic. You know what I'm saying? Everyone's like, I'm just trying to be the same as everybody else. It's like, it's like the capital of middle America. Okay. And I didn't fit in with that paradigm. And then, um, I just started wearing, wearing clothes from Zara and then the clothes just got tighter and tighter. And then, um, yeah, here we are. Nice. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, uh, so that's that part of it. And then the TEDx talk. So that was just like, Hey, uh, I've done 365 days of comedy and I wear tight clothes. Can I do a talk? Is that, how's that well, work? So I'm like, I have a big following on Quora, which is a question and answering platform. Yeah, yeah. And so like one of my followers nominated me to do uh, gotcha, one. Gotcha, and gotcha. then I just shoehorned my, cause I was, it was funny. Cause I was telling people like, yeah, I'm going to do a Ted talk for this. The, the, the intention was always to do a Ted talk for it, but I had no idea how to get a Ted talk. And then randomly like, Two weeks before I finished, one of my followers had dips been like, "Hey, like I nominated you to do TED Talk about things." Gotcha, like, gotcha, right. gotcha. So, do do you are these all from uh, game? The uh, following, the core following. No, um, I did a lot of life advice and stuff like that. Okay. And so you know, I used to be a drug addict, and so I have like kind of a very disparate kind of like stuff. And so I was able to talk about like, yeah, you know, if you want to wake up at three thirty in the morning to train, blah blah blah. This is how you do it, and stuff like that. Some of it was game component as well. Okay. And, yeah. And how, why Quora? Because you're probably the only person I've ever known. Yeah physically to exist on Quora? Um, because I realized how easy it was to generate a following okay. at, at the time. And so I figured out the algorithm and um, I ended up gaining, going from like a hundred followers to, you know, like 70,000 within a year. Jesus Christ. And I had like 28 million reads. And then I was like channeling that into my YouTube. And so I got like 6,000 subscribers that year. Nice. And um, yeah, so like mainly I was just using it as a platform of self-exposure. And it was also a long form way to basically kind of, have people bomb with you. So like where someone sees your tweet, it's hard for them to get invested with you as an individual. There's limited connection, but someone right, reads right. your answer, they feel like really connected to you. And like, I even had people like fly out to Edinburgh from Amsterdam to like see me perform and shit, like kind of like real crazy stuff. Um, yeah. But then I stopped doing it after a while. I was just like, all right. Interesting. How long ago was this? Uh, it's roughly. So uh, it was like about a year and a half ago. Oh, okay. So not that long ago. Okay. Eh, all right. Is, is Quora still like an active platform? Yeah, but like they changed the algorithm. Okay. And so I didn't want to waste answers. So there's like basically questions that are highly followed. And I wanted to keep those for whenever I had a profit incentive rather than just trying to use it to build a following on YouTube. Because basically YouTube, as you know, like the algorithm on YouTube is pretty difficult as well. And so I was just like, I don't want to just channel people here and try to make it off of AdSense or some weird way like that. And so what I did was I just started funneling my following into coaching. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah, that's smart. I should probably do that, man, but I feel like I just don't, I don't know. It's, I, I think a component of this is a lot of, um, what's the word? It's, uh, self, not analysis. It's like self, uh, self-awareness to some extent. And also just like, I'll give you an example. So like, I'll, I'll talk about a medical topic. I'll talk about w whatever I think I know well, but I may find it boring, for example. Mm. So I won't be like, oh, no one wants to hear about this. This is boring. But then if I had a third party in my head to be like, oh, no, dude, someone would really appreciate this kind of knowledge. You should probably like put it up on Quora or YouTube or whatever. It's like, where, what, what's your sense of like your, um, 
self-awareness, I guess, for doing that. You know what so I mean? So I think self-awareness works against confidence a lot of times. So I'm selectively self-aware. Like there's like huge pockets of my life where I will purposely not be self-aware because I, if I was completely self-aware, I wouldn't do it. Like, okay. you know what I'm saying? Like, who am I like to give advice to people, blah, blah, blah. That, that voice definitely occurs. I just don't listen to it. Right. And then I will just kind of, um, create a space to where I'm like, all right, let me, I can eventually find a way to make this interesting. Sure. And I think taste is a huge component of it as well. So like, if you can just be like, I might find this boring, but do, does, does this, is this pleasing? Like, is this pleasing to read? Is this okay. pleasing to watch? Right. Whether or not the topic, like I've been watching a lot of stuff on prisons lately, like about busting cheeks and shit like that. Like, <laughs> you know, like, like cheek busting and like splitting wigs and shit. And you know, like it's just instantly like that guy understood that that was funny. Hmm. And so he okay. kind of explored that topic more and more. So okay. I think at the beginning, almost always there's no reason why you should do it but if you invest deep enough into something there's totally reasons why but no I, yeah i'm not arguing the reasons yeah. i'm just saying like how do you decide which one like uh, i'm trying to think of a good example um it's it's uh, not only thinking like oh this uh, you know i deserve to talk about this but it's also a come of like okay well what am i going to talk about that's mm -hmm. also interesting like how does that taste develop because there's so many things i know mm -hmm. that i just don't find interesting yeah but other people clearly would mm -hmm. and i just don't put it out there it's like how do you how do you connect the the dots of like what's not only interesting but also you know about it and also you should bring it to the table like that's i didn't really think about them that much so I was just like, I think this is interesting. A lot of the stuff was just like a really cultivating for my own taste. So I was just like, oh, I think this is really, really, I'm, I'm really hyped up on nihilism right now. Let me fucking talk about it or okay. whatever like that. And I didn't really get caught up in whether or not I was authority on the subject almost ever. I like, cause the concept of authority is dumb. Yeah, yeah. Like, like, like for example, like most therapists are like, you know, like, yeah, we're like the stewards on what human behavior is like, but I look at their life. I'm like, I don't want to be this fucking, <laughs> you know, like, you know, why should I fucking listen to you? You don't like uh, the therapist has a huge problem. So like when you're a dating coach, part of like you're shepherding a guy through this kind of concept of lack of self-worth like mm -hmm. they're, they're just don't think they deserve to date anybody right and what you like so they'll be like oh i've been in therapy for like 10 years and like they still have not been laid then you talk to them and you're like oh you work them through a couple of these things and then they end up meeting girls and having better relationships so i think like part of it is just like not buying into the accreditation concept of society either or right? you can be a specialist like you can talk about philosophy even if you don't have a phd yeah. actually you're probably better off because most fucking people have a phd in philosophy are fucking lame you know damn son where did yeah. you find this <laughs> yeah fuck yeah fuck shots fired you, <laughs> doctor yeah. you know <laughs> well I, I think i agree for any of these soft sciences but like for oh, the 100 hard science yeah for the hard shit it's like dude i want my engineer accredited or whatever right but um Although I don't even know if they get accreditation. I think they just get hired and do shit. I don't know. Which is even scarier, right? I, well, not really because someone had to hire them, right? So yeah. unlike, uh, it's it's not like you have independent contractor engineers. I yeah. guess you could, I guess. But um, but like they have to have some kind of following or touted for something. Same thing with like a philosophy guy. If, if they have a lot of good Yelp reviews, then maybe you'll go and check out their philosophy. I don't know. Well, I, I definitely agree with you on the hard science thing. And I think that's one of the things that distinguishes the West from like East in terms of like accreditation issues is like there's massive accreditation issues with doctors and stuff like especially like india and bangladesh and stuff like that whereas in america like you know like you guys go through all these fucking tests yeah. every like by the time they get somewhere it's like they really know their shit right. and that's why well actually the sad thing is i meet a lot of dumb motherfuckers really <laughs> 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 through the whole thing i'm just like how did you get this far it's, yeah it's mind-blowing sometimes the kind of decisions some of these doctors make i'm not gonna throw anyone under the bus i don't even have anyone in mind i just i see it constantly whether it was in training or, um, um, yeah, I mean, mostly in training where I would just like, we'd get funneled in patients from like all over the area. Right. And, uh, and you would read these notes by these doctors and I'd be like, why the fuck did you do that? That makes yeah. zero sense. So I don't know. Or maybe just the documentation was, what's that? What made you do, want to become a doctor? Uh, well, I was good at math and science and I was like, all right, well, what can I do with this that, uh, isn't going to keep me broke? Mm. Cause, um, you know, I'm trying to turn this into a stand-up joke so bad, but it's like I had two main motivations to like get rich, which was a the foul odor of like garage sale, yard sale clothes, and then the second thing was like my dad gathering us. It felt like once a week to like chop up rebate coupons and like mail them in to save like I don't know 50, 70 bucks, something like that, which was significant at the time, but it's just like ah, you know, yeah. it wasn't worth it. So that was like uh, that was like one of my main um, motivators 
was money, but like clearly, and I've said this countless times, but um, not to you, obviously, but uh, you know, if, if money's the only motivation, you're not going to last. Like yeah. I, I've seen so many people drop out of med- medical school, switch careers, um, burn out, whatever. Uh, if you do it just for money purposes, but like it definitely was a factor. I'm not going to hide from that because I could have been a nurse. I could have been a pharmacist. I could have been, I, I considered all these options. And then when I sat back, I was like, all right, well, the quote best option for me is doctor and I'm good at it, so I'm going to do it. So I actually remember uh, halfway through medical school, I was at one of those breaking moments where I was like, dude, this fucking sucks. So I was thinking about going and getting into comedy then. I was starting to write jokes. I was too scared to do open mics, but like I was still writing them down. I was consuming all this fucking comedy. I even started looking into any and all different fields to go into. I maybe read one of your posts. I don't know. <laughs> and, um, and then at the end of it, I was just like, yeah, dude, I don't think I'm going to be good at anything other than this doctor thing. So I just buckled down, got through somehow. And then, uh, now I'm at the other end of it. I'm like, Oh, this is amazing. Mm. Cause, uh, my job is great. Uh, the, the staff, the, the patients, the, the population in Iowa, they're super appreciative. Uh, I bring a very clear service to the humanity there. So that part's awesome. You know, um, and you're in, in, in Iowa, like what once a, once a month, the twice, tw- uh, well, yeah, once a month, but two weeks a month, essentially it's occasionally it'll be three weeks. If I'm trying to like catch a holiday cause they pay more on holidays and there's less work. So it's like, why wouldn't I do that? Right. But outside of that, it's usually two weeks there, two weeks here, two weeks there, two weeks there. So, okay. Yeah, that's yeah. what's up. Yeah, man. It's, it's fucking dope. Yeah. So not having an alarm clock when I'm out here is nice. Um, uh, doing the comedy thing out here is amazing. And that's kind of the, the, everyone always asks me like, Oh, you think you'll ever leave medicine? It's like, I don't think so, man. Cause like, A, it feeds a lot of my content and B, um, if I have a bad set, which happens very often these days, cause I'm only six, seven, eight months in, uh, then I can always like be like, all right, well, at least I have this other thing that's like kind of legit. You know yeah. hundred I mean? percent. Cause I always, I never used to understand why artists, even just like a list fucking Hollywood people would like have these breakdowns or whatever, or just like get depressed or like things would happen. And I, and then I finally realized what it was. It's just like, if your whole existence is like a subjective soft science slash uh creative endeavor then if you falter at any point it's going to hit you hard because then you'll be like what the fuck is this really like mm-hmm. what, do i really matter does any of this ex- does any of this matter blah, blah 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 but like at the very least with me i could always go back to being like you know what i fucking save lives bitch like what are you going to tell me like mm-hmm. oh i suck tonight I, I bombed all right ooh, yeah. cool like whatever you know well, have you noticed, so I, I kind of noticed whenever I was doing comedy in Chicago, less so here, but that's because I'm not really part of the community in the same way, but um, that it felt like the more that you were doing outside of comedy, the more you had going for you, the less you were kind of accepted by the scene. Uh, do you do you feel any of that since? Uh, honestly, actually, I've, I've been trying to craft like a beautiful, not story, but like a encapsulation of this thing because I, I go through that and I've gone through that my whole life. So mm-hmm. I'm a doctor. But I'm also a comedian. So I don't feel like I belong with the doctors because I just think doctors are boring mostly. Uh, so I prefer hanging out with comics. But then comics don't want to hang out with me potentially. Be, well, I, I shouldn't say that. That's kind of victimiz- victimizing. But it's it's yeah. it feels that way because it's like, dude, you're not really us. You're like your own thing. Mm-hmm. sort of. Because like, who's this doctor showing up trying to be a comedian? At, at the very least, that first impression, right? And then you throw in that with everything else that I've been through. So like is he a new yorker or is he an iowan like when i'm in iowa i'm the new yorker when i'm here i'm the iowan right so it's like i deal with that then you deal with um you know my parents you know they're growing up middle eastern in a whole different society with- totally thought you were like italian <laughs> I, I was like, this italian dude. I, I- <laughs> yeah, it's just a mustache man. Yeah. but uh no i get that all the time i get usually italian greek and then if i have a very heavy tan i get mexican sometimes yeah. like, i get everything under the sun but you'd make a dope ass spy like you'd be able to like <laughs> you know what i'm saying like you could go on all the jobs you know what I'm hey i'm uh i'm available so if yeah. anyone's hiring <laughs> please reach out but no it's it's just like that's the other thing i'm like ambiguous in all these different regards you've got these middle eastern parents that are raising me one way at home but then i'm going to school and i'm seeing like little boys dicks in the shower and freaking out to the gym teacher and he's just like don't look but then I'm like, all right, well, what's the, where do I belong here? You know, or it's like, you know, you grow up being told like, oh, you're just the Middle Eastern fucker. And then you're like, oh yeah, that's right. And then when I visit home, I'll be, you know, I'll be accepted. And then you go visit home after, you know, 15 years and they're like, oh, look at this fucking American douche. It's just like, all right, so where do I belong here? You know what I mean? So it's, it's just kind of been my whole life just kind of like going through all that. Right. Um, and I'm trying to remember what, what made me answer that what was the question uh, you asked so me? I, oh do I, I feel like uh a little bit like maybe like there is like kind of like a social cost of being successful and yeah realm. that yeah uh see i gotta i gotta really think about that because 
the comedians are all nice, but are they just nice to my face? I don't know. Mm. You know, they, no one's been like overly mean, I guess you could say. But I'm also dealing with mostly open micers. I almost feel like once I start going to more shows and meeting other like quote working comics, uh, then maybe it feels a little bit more eggshelly, if you will. But I, what I've noticed is that the working comics are actually cooler than open micers. You think yeah, so? yeah, the dude, like it's it's crazy to me. Like the people who I've noticed who are like the cockiest and the most like had the most ego around comedy. Fucking open micers. Like, I've done shows with Tracy Morgan. Tracy Morgan's mad cool. Like, you know what I'm saying? Bill Burr's mad cool. All these guys are mad cool. But, like, you know, uh, I think it's because they don't have any insecurity about where they're at. You know what I'm saying? I, okay, yeah. So, I should clarify. Those guys, obviously, are, like, A-list comedians, yeah. right? So, anytime I've interacted with those guys, like, anytime I go to the cellar, yeah. Gotham, uh, wherever, like, they're very welcoming. They're, yeah. they're willing to shake my hands. No yeah. questions asked. They're not like, who's this douche, yeah. right? But, uh, but I meant more like... Um, if you go to the, like the show we went to last night, yeah. I mean, those comics are cool, but like a show at the Lantern or a show at um, any of these variety free shows kind of scattered around the city where like these guys are still doing open mics, but like they're also doing shows mm -hmm. and maybe they've also been on Comedy Central, but they're still doing open mics and yeah. all these other shows. I think that tier, I'm still like kind of navigating a little mm -hmm. bit. Uh, but yeah, I mean, overall my experience has been positive. I just, I still don't get that uh, heavy sensation like yes i belong here you know i yeah. still don't have that but maybe that's just a timing thing i don't know because yeah. well, i'm still new so well and also i think it's a human thing i think like well, like i'm a, similar to you like you know i'm indian and black i was born in london i'm a british citizen but i don't have a british accent and so like then was raised in china and stuff and so it's like you know but i think the content the more i i think about it, i think everybody feels as a, to an extent existential loneliness and i think the more complex of an individual you are the more likely you are to feel that like you know what i'm saying oh for sure for sure like yeah. the, uh, there's something called the isolation paradox that i read somewhere where it's like the more you grow like physically mentally and spiritually the fewer people you can actually have a fulfilling uh, relationship yeah, yeah, with yeah, yeah, yeah. because it's just like there are more dimensions of yourself to be like right. realized right, right no that makes perfect sense because uh you always wondered why like comedians were suicidal but then i finally got it i was like oh okay yeah. you're just more self-aware yeah, yeah. <laughs> self-aware and like honestly hyper romantic about themselves and then there's like this degree of like not feeling like they're in control of their destiny right so like everything is to pursue something where they're either it's a booker that's giving them access like you know they're, they're, it's a constant being interviewed stage yeah. or whatever like that and you're constantly not sure where you are in this hierarchy like you know as a doctor it's very stratified right it's very clear like you know residents blah 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 you know like attendings whatever you know where you are in the thing there's yeah. no status anxiety right. but a comic you know like you're, you're doing pretty good you get jfl and then you know everyone's booking you for a bit but then you have a couple bad sets and like nothing's really coming in then all of a sudden like instead of getting booked every day you're getting booked like three times a week and you're some like, piece of shit gets a special yeah yeah and you're like what the <laughs> fuck him like fuck that i saw bob last week blah, yeah. blah, blah, blah. and so you're like you, you and then you there's this lie that comedy is a meritocracy that everyone i think buys into so i'm writing a book right now about how like cultural myths basically the the more distorted your cultural myth, the farther it is from the way reality actually operates, okay. the more pain it actually causes you as an individual because you don't understand how the system works, right? And so there's constantly, it's like believing in a religion that you that that doesn't have any, the, the practices of it are actually kind of leading you down to a bad path. And we have those myths outside of religion as well. And one of those in comedy is, is that if you're really funny, if you're all you have to do is be really funny and eventually it will all work out right. but that's actually just not the case like i yeah. mean you're better off building a massive following leveraging that into all this other shit before you know focusing and having other people be like that guy is so funny i want to have opportunity yeah and actually I, i've even have it i've even seen it at the opposite where i know people who, who are so funny that bigger comics won't take them on tour with them because like why would you want to take up somebody who's might make you bomb, yeah, yeah. you know? And you know, like then, you know, there's this whole acting component, right? Where it's like, no one really tells you about that, but like, it's actually a massive part of the comedy thing where it's like, yo, if you're, if you're booking commercials and stuff, that's going to help you a long way. Cause then you're just already in the trade. You already know how to act. You already have on screen stuff. Right. And, um, but no one really talks about that. A lot of people just think like, okay, I just do these mics for a few years and then I'll eventually get picked up. Yeah. And it's kind of like, um, this concept of luck that a lot of people buy into where I, when I look at it, it's really not luck. It's just people knowing how to play their cards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I totally agree with that, man. But I think uh, a component of that too is, is uh, do you have the intelligence package to realize that? Mm -hmm. To be like, okay, I have the intelligence to be funny, which of course requires its own intelligence. But then um, 
do I know how to parlay this from mics to a show to booking something to acting to the, I feel like that's its own intelligence mm-hmm. that maybe some co- comics either just ignore and just try to, you know, be stubborn about, or, uh, you just don't get it. You're just like, Oh yeah, I'm going to buy into this idea. And it's just not a smart idea. Well, yeah. well, and also there's social consequence for, for thinking like that. Like there are people, especially uh, back when I was living in Chicago, when you start talking about like parlaying and all this other stuff, people start looking at you kind of like suspicious. There's like, um, I don't know, I, there's not a proper term for it, but uh, do you know who Machiavelli is? I've heard the name. So he wrote this book called The Prince about yeah. how basically social engineering on a high level for, and he um, he was just describing how things worked and operated, but he had actually a massive amount of social cost for some of the ideas that he had for being too aware of like, how it operated. Can you give an example? So like, uh, I, d- I don't, that, that, that's as far as my extent uh, for him, but like right. there are other, um, I'm gonna quickly look at it. Um, but there are other people in history where it's like, if you show that you know too much about how things operate, there's like a level of suspicion that people have. And Robert Green writes about it in the 48 laws of power, where it's like, it's better to assume, like have people assume that you're stupid because then they're less, they, they, less they, alarmed. Yeah. Yeah. They, you just seem less conniving. No, I mean, that makes perfect sense because who's more threatening, the conniving guy who knows how things operate or yeah. the conniving guy who doesn't do shit, right? Exactly. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Um, but yeah, man, it's such a frustrating process because like your intentions could be good, but you start talking or acting a certain way and people start getting suspicious of you and you're just like, all right, what are you supposed to fucking do here? Yeah, you know? exactly. Well, you, what the, one thing I've noticed though is a lot of the people who are moving the right way are totally on board with talking like that and like welcome it and it's refreshing, but it also can just like lead to a degree of isolation and like concepts of etiquette, right? Like, so like, it's kind of like an unspoken rule that you shouldn't be talking about this with certain people or right, whatever right, like that, but the only way to find out who's what is to like risk alienating yeah, some people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And some people are just impossible to please. Right, right. Well, yeah, I, th- I think it's kind of similar to like a, like a country club. It's like maybe all these rich people join country clubs because they want to talk about money, but they can't talk about it with fucking the plumber and the mechanic down the street. They got to talk about it with other people who like fuck with money it's just exactly. like, you know, like you can't it, it's probably basically the exact thing it's just like oh let's not talk about money but it's like all right well if we don't talk about it how are we supposed to make it it's like exactly you know, so it's probably something similar well but, you know like that's what i everyone um so my my older sister went to to wharton and stuff like that and uh, we have had a lot of uh, different people in my family go to like ivy league schools and i didn't but one of the things that i tell people is the benefit of that is is that you're you have basically a group of people who are really intelligent together and you, you don't have to run that far to have that kind of conversation and before the internet existed that was really rare yeah. it was really rare to be able to turn to the person next to you and have them be a hyper talented individual and especially when you're looking at schools like harvard yale stanford or oxford or cambridge you literally have like one in ten thousand people one in twenty thousand people that you can just interact with like mark zuckerberg literally turned to his roommate and started a multi-billion dollar company and that's crazy like if you if you think about that from a probability standpoint that's absolutely insane that you would have somebody positioned that close to you to be able to take a company that far to yeah. basically <clears throat> be that valuable and the same with bill gates i don't think it was his roommate but it was somebody who he had met at harvard and they were able to create something of that much value right, right, right. and um, yeah, i can't get a fucking roommate to like film a youtube video with me so right. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah right and, and and that's it's actually crazy because like you know like the amount of investment people have in certain projects that's one of the things um like usama and i and uh karen margolis we wrote we wrote like this show called brown guys who fuck and like you know we we were in con talking to lions why is she on that uh because uh so we we, number one we needed a white woman because you know diversity (laughs) um so she she was our white woman is yeah yeah and so she was our roommate in the thing and it just basically added like uh, a, a you know a color sure, cast or sure, whatever sure. like that but it was like really great to work with them because they're both people who when they say they're going to do something they do it right, right right because a lot of times which is very underrated by the way what very underrated yeah very underrated like yeah. you know like 90 percent of it especially when you're working against creative people is just doing oh the my work god dude, jesus christ well like one of the things i thought about was this was like when i was doing the math of wanting to be a comedian was like there are probably 3,000 to 5,000 active comedians, like active, like going up multiple times a week yeah. in America. So there are like 50,000 applicants to big law jobs. So 
already being a comic isn't nearly as competitive. Then you take a look at the work ethic issues, drug habits, all this other shit. You're like comparing, there's not that many people ahead of you. Right. Then you get in a place where, are they in a situation? Are they in a city where they can actually succeed? Yep. That gets rid of a massive component. So then you're like really competing against like 200, 300 people, right? And then from there- yeah, Don't tell that to the line. I had to wait in a fucking comic strip live right, for right. Like four hours, man. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah. Fuck. But yeah, you just look at it. It's like not that many people. And there's a lot of people who- just don't know how to work hard or, you know, end up shooting themselves in the foot. Um, and I think that's pretty much across the form with almost all art forms because it's so subjective. There's yeah. not really that kind of objective critique. Am I doing better? Like uh, I used to do a lot of sports. Do you do sports? Yeah. Yeah. Like sports. It's funny because, um, I've noticed so many comedians who've done really well at comedy really fast that used to play D1 sports or compete or whatever like that because the concept of failing doesn't hit you as bad. Yep. You understand rigor, consistency, intensity, all this other stuff. There is a self-awareness that you have to cultivate and there's a not being a good enough that you are made friends with right. whenever you're playing sports that I don't think you're going to get from like, oh, hey, like, I, you know, I, I don't do sports, but I, I talk about feminism all the time. Like, you know, you're not going to get that kind of objective critical um you're not gonna be that critical of yourself right. in the right yeah way. no I've, I've noticed that too with like i think it just, again just goes back to a lot of self-awareness like so many people just either don't have an instagram or they just they're like I don't, I, how did you even know to do that but in my head i'm just like how could you not know how to do this you know what i mean uh, whether whatever it is i can't think of a specific example but um uh I was going to ask you more specifically about for those moments when like you don't feel funny. So like the past week or so, I've just like, I haven't even gone to any mics because I'm like, I don't, I don't got anything. Mm -hmm. I got nothing new. So, and then I'm watching other comedians and then I'm like, all right, man, how the fuck is this guy this funny? Or even the people that aren't that funny and I'm just watching, I'm just like, fuck, they got this special, but I'm not laughing. I don't feel funny. And just like, it all just kind of becomes this vicious cycle where I'm just like stuck. Do you ever have those? And what do you do about it? Well, like actually the first time we met, I was like waist deep in that shit. Like I could not feel like, like it's funny. I could not, cause I'm a type of comic where I, I don't even like having a set list or anything like that. And I'm just now trying to get back to where I was where, cause like I, I, I just wasn't feeling it. And it's, sometimes it's just like, just fucking take a break from comedy. And honestly, comedy's not that fucking serious. Um, I remember one, <laughs> one time I like wrote down, I, I, it was like on day like 350 or whatever. And I, I bombed at this mic, um, Dope Meets Fresh, Emerald City Coffee. And I was like, I fucking hate these people. <laughs> like, I, I, I fucking hated them. And I, I, I get in my car and, or no, I get, I get in the Uber and I'm like tearing up. I'm so upset. And then I'm like, this is fucking ridiculous. <laughs> and so I go back home and I write down everything that's more important to me than stand up. And it was like a lot of shit, like, you know, and that actually, that act of like basically not making stand up important to me, it makes you so much more funny. Dude, it's fucking jokes. It's nothing. It's like, and everybody gets so fucking romantic and hiring themselves like, yeah, you know, like comedy is like fucking sacred. No, it's fucking not, dude. Like, you, dude, like no, I'm at the comedy <laughs> seller, your fucking thing. He, it's a check to him. This is, there's, this, there's no sacredness in all of this shit. You're not fucking a philosopher. Actually, you're probably too lazy to be a philosopher and that's why you're comic. All right. Like nothing's that profound and seeing yourself objectively, you can be like, oh, okay there yeah yeah true <laughs> yeah but uh but then where's the material come from oh uh, it was i like i think do you are you part of group chats yeah yeah i would just be like <laughs> i just be in your group chat more you know what i'm saying like, no trust me I've, I've stolen plenty of jokes from my group chat because <laughs> yeah. uh because they're not gonna get on stage so yeah. i'm like someone's gotta use this someone's shit man. this is gold you know <laughs> yeah or, or you know maybe travel or something man yeah well i mean i get a lot of material from work obviously because yeah. i'm a doctor but again this goes back to what i was telling you earlier which is like i'll have something quote interesting happen at work but to me it wasn't interesting so mm. I'll, it'll just gloss over me i'm like oh fuck that could have been some good material do you, know? are, do you know what your point of view is what do you mean like do you have like a kind of like a point of view like like a way in which that you look at the world right oh okay right like my point of view is uh, very rose-colored glasses -y. So, like, I look for the positive in everything, which okay. is very not conducive to comedy, I find, because mm -hmm. a lot of it has to be like, what the fuck is this horse shit? Yeah. You know what I mean? So, And I'm capable of finding that sometimes if I'm actively looking for it, especially ever since I started comedy, I'm looking for the joke now, right? Mm -hmm. But my uh, innate skills, not skill set, but, like, my innate... POV is what's the positive here? You okay, know? Yeah. yeah, super faggy. No. <laughs> <laughs> Zing. Yeah. yeah, no, it's it's kind of it's kind of cucky, but yeah. it is what it is, you know. No, it's it's all good, you know. Um, that yeah, I think once you kind of make a relationship with not like I remember I had a time 
similar to you because I'm a like naturally positive dude where I had to distinguish my living point of view from my comedic point of view and that took a while to like cultivate right where it's like like the system of thoughts because like what happened what I noticed what first happened with me in comedy was it was just like trying to make anything funny right, right. like yeah man like I let girls throw up on, uh, Ebola's going around gotta stop letting girls throw up on me though <laughs> and like you know and then it goes to like you know like oh let me recite stories that have happened in my life like this was the time I was doing cocaine and playing World of Warcraft and then it kind of got to like where I wanted it to be more about my day and then it started morphing into like kind of like existential philosophy and stuff and like suicide and all this other shit and now it's like fuck boy like Fuck boy shit, and, and but it, it's like where where everything is like kind of contouring in my mind, and so like one of the new bits I've been thinking a lot about was about how like I could be Stalin and like because like you know what yeah, yeah like because <laughs> I'm, I'm like mad petty, and then I think about this as like you know Stalin had like 130 million people, you know, and like. I have like 700 sheets of toilet paper and I wipe my ass with those. And so like, like, so that kind of combination of like the value of human life, I don't really understand what it's like to have 130 million people. So how the fuck am I going to judge a guy? You know? And, um, like I like trying to like, I want it. I like moral shit. Like that's my thing is like, why, why is it? Well, you can like certain topics or whatever. Right. But the issue is how do you make it funny? Right. So yeah. like you- I, I, I at least struggle with like, like you said stories, right? Yeah. I would love to tell more stories, but it's like, I don't know how to make this story funny. Yeah. I don't know how to quote punch it up. I don't know how to add this here and that there. I'm getting a little bit better at it, but I'm still not like, cause I have a very, uh, concrete yeah. thinking brain. So like I take things at face value when a girl says, Hey, you want to come over and watch a movie? I go and watch the movie. Like yeah. that's, that's my brain, you know? Yeah. But, uh, but that's not very conducive to comedy because you want to use a little exaggeration and hyperbole and oh, 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 throw a little thing in there. It's like, I, I my, my, my brain isn't there, you know, mm. but I don't know. Is, is you that right on Twitter? No, I'm not a Twitter guy. So I, what I would do is, is practice on Twitter, like writing jokes because it makes you really economic and it like, the structure of it becomes like, it, it just shows you kind of gives you an intuitive structure for stuff. Here's my problem with that is like, I really want to get away from being like the ba 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 type of comic. I want to be more like, um, I'm just jealous of comedians who have a bit that's like a five minute bit yeah. about one topic, marriage, sex, uh, drugs, whatever. But like the thing about that is, is that you have to be in a space in which that you have the time to do that. Right. So oh, of like, course. Yeah. yeah. Like, so it's like, it's hard to be like, you know, go off on like this whole thing about like, you know, like, you know, marriage or divorce or like love and sex and all this stuff when you only have like a 10 minute spot, right? Because they're not bought into you all the way. How the fuck are they going to be bought into a five yeah. minute story? No, I agree with you on that. I'm just saying in general, like this is kind yeah. of the, the place I want to head to, which mm. is how can I talk about something for longer than premise, punchline, premise, mm. punchline, premise, punchline. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I feel that. That's what I'm trying to figure out. Yeah. Have you ever just gone up there and riffed for like a month? Always. Always. That's yeah. that's basically what I do. I don't, yeah. like I have jokes written down and I'll, I don't, I don't know how other comics do this, but obviously everyone has their own style. But like to sit down and write, that shit sounds torturous to me. For me, it's more like I'm sitting down playing a video game or I'm out in the world seeing something and I'm like, holy shit, this is funny to me. Let me write this down. Mm-hmm. So I'll write down a basic premise and a punchline right in my notes and then I'll take it up on stage if, you know, whenever the time comes. But yeah, I think with this latest phase of me not feeling funny, like today, if I hit a mic, I, I'm probably just going to get up there and be like, so, dude, you know, just yeah. like, and just see where my mind goes. But again, because I, I'm not a naturally funny guy, like I'm not, you know, those guys you hang out with that aren't even comics, but they're fucking hilarious. Yeah. I'm not one of those guys, unfortunately. So like, I feel like that's also not conducive to just pure riffing, but I feel like that whole, you know, get up on stage till you find your voice type of thing. I kind of buy into that too, because I write jokes different now than I used to my first set because I have a different perspective now of like, okay, this will work on stage. This won't, someone will come to me with a joke like, Oh, this is funny. You should talk about this. I'm like, eh, this is not going to work for stand up, mm-hmm. Kind of like that. So like I'm, I'm becoming more self-aware there, but I, it'd be nice if I was just naturally funny to be able to incorporate that into more of like a conversational riff type of thing. You know, I feel that. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, well like the, the issue that I had was whenever I first started was I was so, I wanted I realized that my voice actually sounded completely different on stage than off stage when I'm joking with my friends, which was like mad weird. Like you'll like listen to the recording. I'm, I'm like, it sounded like all shaky and shit. And it's not like, yeah, dude, blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, and like the, the and I, was, I had a hard time getting in that fucking headspace. Um, yeah. Cause like, I've seen a lot of people who believe they're funny off stage and can get on stage and they, it's like, yeah, but this is still art form. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so like they, they, there's like, there's like a gap between them and they, it's, it's kind of, they can't even put their finger on it. You know, right. and I think that's the hard part about comedy is being funny with the social pressure 
of having to be funny, right? Uh, with the pr- yeah, yeah, for sure, for you sure. Know, That's definitely a different level, especially then you add in if you're starting to get paid. Yeah, you gotta you gotta deliver, blah blah yeah. blah. So. Or you don't like fuck it. Yeah, I, but yeah. I mean, if you want to quote make it, you're gonna yeah. have to, right? That's Maybe what you're here for, right? <laughs> you know, like, dude, there's like so many people who, who make mad money off comedy who eat shit all the time. What you really want to do is just have an audience. Oh, of like, course, yeah. Like, like an audience to watch you fucking bomb. Fuck it. Like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I remember one time in Edinburgh, I walked half the fucking audience. The, for, the day before, murder people were telling me I was mad funny. Walked half the audience had a blog post written about me. Um, nice. Yeah, I was like, I was like, yeah, you know. <laughs> they're like, the, 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 um, I had a bit about MLK getting assassinated that people didn't like and uh, Eric. Ariana Grande but you know I think that like I think part of it is honestly making not giving the audience what they want and because there's going to be a point where you're going to have to fucking bomb a lot to find another level of your funny and there's a lot of people who just won't go through that so they'll just stay at this like one level you know I think I'm probably right there right there because um so so, yeah going back to what we were talking about earlier with the whole dichotomy thing it's, I think it kind of has fucked me up maybe in the long run. I mean, we'll find out. But um, I think it's uh, I'm a little fucked up in the head because when I go to Iowa to do comedy, granted, there's only two shows a week, one on a Monday, one on a Wednesday. But those shows have regular people in them. And so those open mics feel like a booked show. Yeah. And it's Iowa comedy. It's not New York comedy. So it's like it's a lot more forgiving as far as getting laughs yeah. uh, compared to here. So like that's, I, I want to say that might've fucked me up a little bit because every time I come back here, I almost become a little bit more miserable because I'm like, oh, I got to do this now, you know? And then, um, you know, even I, I went on a run in uh, in Albany when I was visiting. They, uh, you know, they happen to be doing comedy. They just started doing comedy not too long ago and they happen to be the one week that I happen to be home for the first time. And uh, I asked them if I could get on. They said, sure. And then uh, they gave me 10 minutes for the first one. They loved it. They're like, oh, can you do 15 minutes on Monday? I'm like, fuck yeah. And then I come right back here, three minutes, baby. I'm yeah. like, ah, you know, and no one's laughing. So, hey, what's up? Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, I, I think that fucked me up because when I'm out there and there's regular people in the crowd, I want to do the jokes I know work. And yeah. I don't want to bomb and I don't want to risk new jokes potentially. Although I'll, I'll throw in at least one or two new jokes each set just because I'm do this is like a prime opportunity. But then here, it's like I'm trying to establish myself here. I'm trying to meet other comedians. I want other comedians to find me funny because, again, that's how they book you, right? They got to A, like you, and B, think you're funny. Um, so, like, yeah, man, it's, it kind of fucks me up because I'm, like, m- more miserable because I've been exposed to something else quote better and then i come back here and i'm like trying to ingratiate myself with the comics because that is the crowd here so it's like do i really want to bomb but if i don't then how am i going to get better it's like it's that whole thing yeah man dude fuck fuck everybody here like i'm dead serious like (laughs) like like like, uh, real talk um when i go to other cities when i I play the road and everything like that murder all those places i take those wins i take my club sets over like shit around comics fuck comics dude <laughs> they, 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 like, like literally fuck comics I'm, I'm on that shit dude you go to creek in the cave and it, like shit that you, that's worked all over the country that you, you murdered all the different kinds of crowds people come up to you and tell you great joke and like it's like this cold bomb like will i ever be funny fuck them dude like i'm gonna <laughs> let a fucking bunch of nobodies who haven't been late like, you're gonna get up there and talk about you how you haven't been late for another six months and i'm supposed to try to make to please you fuck that yeah no you, the, the thing is, is to stay in your own lane, keep building your own shit. It, you don't have to graduate through that scene. Most of those people don't actually have power. And I've seen so many people get so dissuaded because, and so many talented people with unique point of views and unique stories get like really put off because like of what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. And like, and you, they're like, can I even be funny? Right. And they feel like this weird, like, will they ever like me? No, bro, you're not <laughs> fucking like them because you're probably going to be successful at this. And so like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, it's like, I don't know. To me, whenever I stopped hanging out at sceny places, I got happier. Whenever I started like, you know, investing in other shit, like doing the other stuff, I got happier. And like the way I see it is it doesn't take that long to build material. Everybody thinks it takes a really long time. No, you just need a bunch of, of good stage time. Not bad, shitty, three minute, like, let me see how this works in an autistic audience. Like good <laughs> fucking stage time you know what i'm saying like real <laughs> where people are gonna let you play around for a bit and not everything yeah. has to be funny all the way and so you can kind of piece it together and you can do that completely outside of this hierarchy yeah. you and so you don't think there's any validity to let me win these fuckers over no fuck them no? like okay. dude, like to, to me i've seen too many people rise up who they never backed who they never backed I, I, in every scene i've seen people just rise up get the shit that never had their yeah. fucking a-okay well no I, i'm i'm definitely not saying go to these guys for um 
uh, what do you call it, for promoting you, I guess. I'm definitely not looking for that from yeah. anybody. Yeah. And I really don't expect it. If it happens, great. Yeah. But I, like you said, building the audience, that's what all this is. So um, I'm building my own audience. And um, if I want to book my own show, I'll do it somewhere. I don't exactly. fucking need any of these places. But what I meant more was like, I also don't want to just build a following because you know these fucks that just like build a following over whatever and then they just think they can just do put a show together. But yeah. they're not funny. They're not entertaining. They're yeah. not whatever. And again, that's subjective because maybe it's just not for me, right? Yeah. But the bottom line is like, I know personally, I would love to make as many people laugh as possible. So like if I can win over a room, that would feel good. Yeah, but you're right. Like maybe it'll never happen and it doesn't well, need to. Well, so. The thing is, is the, the the look in your face, right, of wanting to win them over makes them not want to fucking be on your side. And there's going to be a cadence in your voice where you're not going to access that like fucking alpha, like I don't give a fuck, <laughs> like, you know, yeah, and, yeah. and you're not going to hit that frequency where you're not looking to them for approval. And so... I totally get what you're saying. Where like you know, if PewDiePie came out with a fucking comedy special, it's gonna be ass as fuck, right? Like because he doesn't have experience being a stand up. But that shit's gonna sell out. Yeah, sell, yeah, <laughs> Madison Square Garden. But, but what, what I am saying is this: is that like you know, I would celebrate the wins in Iowa and your road shows and all that shit. And you come here and you just dick the fuck around. I would not give a shit about the stuff that you're really doing here. If you want to get booked on these shows produce your own fucking show and then swap fucking spots because yeah, that's yeah. fucking what everyone does anyway right. show up to people's show play the fucking game right. and like part of it's just familiarity but like to me whenever you you uh, kind of put your self-esteem out there and it's like not even intentional it's just like a little bit like you kind of be like hey like this, this i see so and so kill all the time did, did they laugh during my fucking shit and you're like dude it doesn't fucking matter yeah. like, i mean they probably weren't listening yeah they, they, yeah, they probably <laughs> weren't listening they're like oh, I can't fucking yeah. believe i'm not up yet yeah but yeah, I, I don't know, man. Oh yeah, that's definitely another factor that's really eating away at me. I just don't know how much more bad comedy I can watch mm -hmm. with these open mics. And I'm just like, really? I'm going last again? So you're telling me I got to sit through all this shit again? Yeah, like, just start doing sets again, in the subway. again. Do what? Start doing sets in the subway. In the subway. <laughs> no, I have a friend who's done sets in the subway for a year and a half. Really? Like, yeah, in the L in Chicago, and he came out here, does, did some. I mean, you have... People. Well, he just yells on the car. He's like, "Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, I'm getting ready for a show tonight. Um, so I'm gonna be doing some stand-up comedy. If you don't want to hear it, uh, sorry." <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then he does John Clay Hero, but and um, yeah, he uh, he does it. It's it's made him a lot better. It's made him fearless. Huh. It's real people. He's gotten paid from it. So it's instead of spending five dollars per spot, it's interesting a in built audience. You can do it wherever in terms of time efficiency, like it fucking you can't beat it. Right. You right, just right. hop on the train. Right. And um, huh. yeah. I wonder what kind of material he does. Uh, he, dude, he does all sorts of stuff. Some from like uh, some of it's like non edgy. Some of it is fucking really edgy race shit. All the stuff. And you know, you if you want to like add a little bit more of like pizzazz to it, bring that portable box. You know what I'm saying? Get a mic in there, and it makes some amazing footage for your channel or whatever like that. Right, right, right. So right. yeah. Does he have footage up? I'd like to no, see No, no, he just keeps it to himself. Just okay. like basically, it's just a grind to work on. And gotcha. he does that at all times. So he'll do it at five in the morning. He'll do it at fucking 3 p.m. That'd be fun to do with somebody. Like, yeah. let's have a conversation out loud on this train. Yeah. That could be kind of cool. Well, it's fun to do. I've done it with him in the car. And so it's really good whenever you have somebody else that you no right, in there right. because you don't feel like you're right. fucking crazy. Right. right? But it, the, it, to do it just completely by yourself, it, it's intense. Oh, I'm but, sure it's like a good building block, yeah. but yeah, I don't know that I'd be ready to do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it, I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an intense um, thing, but it's just like, yeah, if you're like, you know, worried about like wasting time or whatever like that, fuck it. Just hop on the subway. There's just like all these different other avenues to be fucking funny, you know? Also, poetry open mics, dude. Huge, I've heard about that, yeah. Huge sleeper, dude. Like, they'll give you 10 fucking 15 minutes. You're in a coffee shop. A lot of times, real people, they um, a lot of times book you to host their like shows. Oh, really? like, like, oh yeah, I'm having like this like fucking soiree like in brooklyn come out to my house show and you're like all right like you interesting. know interesting yeah I, I've, been, I've heard that from another comic too i just haven't gotten around to doing uh maybe that is my next move because like i dude these open mics man I'm, dude they fucking I'm dying man yeah dying. yeah dude you know and like i think you're doing the right thing by like hanging out at other shows like fucking meeting bookers yeah and not only that but just just to fucking laugh at something man yeah. like that's you know and uh and not all the shows i go to are good um but uh, but at least it's a step up from the open mics. It's like God damn it, man! I can't can't do it. I can't do it. But I mean, there's also something to be said about can you fucking put yourself through this attrition bullshit? Like yeah, hundred you know? percent. So there's that too. Well, but. and you notice the comics who don't. They, like like um, people who've been famous in other realms who do a crossover into just uh, to do crossover into stand up. There's something missing. There's a grit. There's an edge they don't have. Yeah. That, you know. 
I did it. I did it like uh, there was one month in Chicago. I did went up 74 times like fucking all garbage ass rooms, all this other shit. But like past a certain point, you you've learned you you you've gone through the attrition and you're yeah, just like yeah. you're, you're you're in the trench and the war's over. Right. Like, you know, and I think that like, you know, it, it's also like a, a, a cesspool of, you know, like I remember you know, when I, my show in Edinburgh is called, if you feel like killing yourself, call me. And it was like all the suicide material. And I don't, I only realized this in retrospect after I moved to New York. Oh, I was actually depressed. I was actually full blown, really, really depressed. And I was fantasizing about killing myself all the time. And I just thought like, Oh, it's because I'm creative. Like, that's why, that's why I'm <laughs> thinking about hurling myself in front of every fucking train. And, um, yeah. And I was just like, Oh, it's because I'm just around a lot of really sad people. And a lot of people where it's like, not working out so you want to you want to spend your time with people who are going to have the ideas to get you where you want to go i'd also say like are you hanging out at clubs uh yeah, yeah. i was literally at uh the stand last night and comedy cellar yeah. um starting to meet more and more people there comics there um not the bookers but like uh, some of the other staff there and they've been super nice to me and that's awesome you know it feels really good 100 percent. actually yeah. i met the owner of the stand last night uh he actually recognized he called me over he's like hey i see your youtube i was like oh, oh shit, shit. That's, awesome. like, that's dope yeah, yeah, dude yeah. so i'm gonna go back tonight for the uh fight club uh comedy fight club thing because i think they do it now uh there um and yeah it just was like a super welcoming environment i was hanging mm -hmm. out with other comics just having a good time I, I, right after your show i, I yeah. went to, i followed um uh charles over to uh the stand and then we just kind of hung out there for a little bit so that was cool yeah it's always yeah. great dude everyone there is kind of chill it's like if you're there you belong and it's like an easy way because if you get one booker on your side that's worth 20 indie shows right so it's just like you turn you think of like it t times and resources it's just like spending if you just go to the if you go and hang out at the stand like just pick one club and just hang out at the stand every day for like three months eventually you're gonna get up like you know what i'm saying like you know you're doing other stuff you're getting funny but they're they're going to watch your clip right, right. you know because a lot of times you'll send in your fucking clip they don't fucking know you they have nine thousand people who are yep. sending in clips they're not gonna they're gonna go with what works but if you're there every day you're cool blah 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 you're talking to somebody you can get some recommendations or right, whatever right. like that yeah so that's the thing i know for a fact that i'm enough of a not douchebag to be able to get booked someday right? yeah i know that and I totally agree with you. Put in the time, get to know people, be nice, just fucking just be around, yeah, right? Yeah, dude. But on top of all that, I also don't want all that to happen because I know I'll get on stage, right? But then when I get up there, I don't want to be bad, you mm -hmm. know? No one does, I think, right? Um, and so I do want to put in the work and the and the effort and all those other gritty grind shits yeah. that you have to go through. So it's just tough, man, because I think you, you put it in perspective for me. I think I'm right at that stage where it's just like, dude, you just got to get ready to bomb for a while. A man. while you and know, find just yourself, Find dude. some stuff, yeah. Yeah, and, and well, you're going to find yourself and you're going to find like your real point of view because like it's like when all that val so many people don't want to go through that period of not being funny yeah. there, there, there's so many people who just don't want to let go of their tent right like you know and um and it's just like in that you kind of find a sense of freedom and you kind of be like okay this right, is right. and then you start building again but i think that's the cool thing about comedy is that so many inbuilt identity crises because if you're tired of telling a joke the audience feels it you know what i'm saying like and that's you don't get that same thing with a song like right. you can fake being into a song you can't really dude, the more i get into comedy the more i'm fucking jealous of musicians oh man. dude I'm yeah just like motherfuckers because they don't have to be <laughs> self-aware in the same way like you Absolutely can't have not. rapper confidence and be a comic right yeah. <laughs> Dude, it's fucking annoying. And uh, and think about it. You get to just sit at home. Like, this would be the album, right? Yeah. And then this would go out. Yep. And then a billion people are like, yo, we're about this. And then we would just press play on this conversation forever. Exactly. Like <laughs> That's it. And then you go in there and you just, like, you take off your shirt. And then they you get them to say half the lines of your shit. You know? But I think there is something about comedy that's really fun. And I think... I think the real comics, to me, like, whenever I hear about, like, old school comics, like, not wanting to burn material, I'm like, fucking burn jokes who gives a shit what do you mean burn material so like like, like letterman and shit like that they're like never came out with specials because they don't want to lose jokes because see, they see. look at it as a finite resource where i'm like i don't give a fuck about a joke after it works kind of like right. even kind of like i don't right. I, I just want to yeah. like to me a, a good comic is always going to have good material so like just as soon as you have the material put it out and keep moving keep exactly moving, keep moving, because yeah. that's the joy in making the jokes is right. like trying to get shit that works and is like fucking and fucking up like if you have fun bombing like a little bit like then you know <laughs> like i was fucking up left and right yesterday like yeah. you know but it's like still like it's not attacking my identity i think also here's the thing is accepting that you're funny 
And that that was like for me the first year I was like, oh, I'm not funny, I'm not this, I'm not that. But then I think of all these E equals MC squared motherfuckers in comedy, who like you know are the guys who with the pen and paper all the time, but don't make anybody laugh off stage. And I'm like, oh, I'm funnier than I mean I used to roast guys like you know what I'm saying. And then and then you accept that you're funny, then you stop trying to prove to yourself you're funny because a lot of people are trying to prove that they're funny every time they get on stage, and that's why your fucking confidence is going through wild swings. You fucking kill one night and you're like. I'm a fucking comedy guy, bro, <laughs> motherfucker. And then, you, you know, and then you bomb and you're just like, I don't think I'll ever be funny or so and so's never seen me have a good set. And then, but once you just accept that you're funny, right? And you just accept it, you're not the funniest motherfucker, you're not the worst, you're just funny, then you can just have the freedom to fuck up, right. you know? 